Here's another monster who might be released back into society. This time we're going to Canada. Robert Willie Picton was arrested in 2002, accused of taking dozens of lives on his farm near Vancouver. He was eventually sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. For years, he had been luring women to the farm that he had converted into a party spot called the Piggy Palace Good Time Society, where he would do evil things to them, and there was some truly horrific evidence against him. A warning was even issued to the public that the remains of victims may have been mixed in with the pork that Picton had sold. As is often the case, there had been multiple opportunities to stop the horrors going on at the farm, including a woman coming forward who Picton had attacked with a knife in 1997. While the exact number of victims is unknown, he would brag to an undercover cop in jail that he wanted to take one more life to make it an even 50. Robert Willie Picton is now eligible for day parole and full parole in 2027. On the eastern coast of British Columbia, hidden beneath the tranquil facade of a pig farm, lies one of the darkest chapters in Canadian history. This is the story of Robert Picton, a man whose name would become synonymous with evil and unimaginable horror. Robert William Picton was born on October 24, 1949, in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. Raised on the family pig farm alongside his brother and sister, Robert's early life was marked by hard labor and isolation. Their mother would often send them to school in clothes filthy from working on their farm, which led Robert to be called Stinky Piggy by his peers. Despite his mother's domineering nature and indifference to her children's hygiene, young Robert was close to her, perhaps to have a defender against his abusive father. The Pictons were a strange family and mostly kept to themselves. The kids were often dirty and smelled of pigs. Robert especially was said to have been quiet and always off in his own world. He struggled in school and after failing the second grade was moved to a special needs class. At home, the harsh reality of living on a farm took its toll when at 12 years old a calf that he had taken special care of and thought of as a pet was butchered for meat while he was at school. In 1963, when he was 14, Picton dropped out of school and began working as a meat cutter which he would do for seven years before leaving to work at the family farm full time. The farm was a harsh environment with Robert and his siblings often neglected and left to fend for themselves. The passing of their father in 1978 and their mother in 1979 only deepened Robert's reclusiveness. As the years passed, the farm became a magnet for outcasts and drifters, setting the stage for the horrors that would later unfold. In the 1990s, the Picton brothers took advantage of the increased traffic and transformed part of their farm into a party venue known as the Piggy Palace Good Time Society, and it was granted nonprofit status. Here they hosted raucous events that drew crowds from all walks of life, including many of Vancouver's most vulnerable citizens. The Piggy Palace became infamous. It was a place where people went to let loose, often attracting those living on the margins of society. It wasn't long before women, particularly sex workers from Vancouver's downtown east side began to disappear after attending the wild parties. Between 1997 and 2001, the number of disappearances continued to grow. Vulnerable women were lured to the farm with the promise of money or narcotics, never to be seen alive again. The police were slow to act, often dismissing the reports of missing women due to their lifestyles. Making police look even worse, Prior to his eventual arrest for homicide, Picton was arrested for attacking a woman named Wendy Lynn Estetter with a knife in March of 1997. However, because of her issues with addiction, Wendy was not considered a credible witness and the charges against him were stayed. The indifference to her claims foreshadows the eventual horrors that would take place in the following years. The methods used by Picton were brutal. Typically, his victims were either strangled or dispatched with a knife, and then their remains were put through a wood chipper and fed to his pigs or sent with animal parts to a nearby rendering plant. One of the most horrifying aspects of the case would come out in 2004 when the health minister issued a warning to the area that Picton may have also mixed human meat in with the pork that was sold to the public. 
Among the dozens of victims, six women stood out in the trial that ultimately would convict Robert Picton. Their lives, though tragically cut short, are remembered by their families and the community. The first known victim, Marnie Frey, was born on August 28, 1973 in Campbell River and spent a good portion of her childhood camping and fishing with her dad. Unfortunately, she fell into addiction and left high school in the 11th grade. At 19, she had a daughter and she did whatever she could to earn money on the streets of Vancouver. She was last seen in August of 1997 and her family was left to wonder what had happened to her for years. When police finally raided Picton's farm, her DNA was found on a wood chipper and her jawbone and some teeth were the only pieces of her found intact. Brenda Wolfe was born on December 25, 1957 in Lethbridge. Her vice was alcohol and her dependence stemmed in part from the abuse she suffered at the hands of her father's family. Drifting to Vancouver in 1996, Brenda worked as a waitress and bouncer at the Balmoral Hotel but continued to have problems as her common-law husband also mistreated her. Brenda vanished in February of 1999. A partial skull and some bone fragments were all that was recovered. Georgina Pappin was born on March 11, 1964 in Edmonton. She was a devoted mother of seven children. Her family described her as a fighter who loved her children deeply, but who fell on hard times after cancer and addiction ravaged her life. She disappeared in March of 1999 and some pieces of bone and teeth were found on Picton's farm three years later in 2002. Andrea Josbury, born on August 28, 1978, grew up in Victoria. At 16, she ran away from home and lived in Vancouver's east side with her boyfriend and the father of her child, who was 20 years older than her. At the time of her disappearance, she was enrolled in a methadone program in an attempt to get her life back on track and regularly spoke with her family by phone. Andrea was last seen in June of 2001. The only thing that was recovered from the farm were some pieces of bone. Serena Abotswe was born on August 19, 1971. Despite a tumultuous childhood in the foster care system starting at just four years old, she was known for her resilience and kindness. As an adult, her hardships continued and she succumbed to addiction as so many of Picton's victims. This made it easy for the monster to lure her out to his farm. Serena was last seen in August of 2001. The only parts of her that would be recovered were a piece of her jawbone and some other small fragments. Mona Wilson was born on January 13, 1975 in Kelowna. She moved with her mother to Vancouver when she was young, but was soon placed into foster care after her mother's boyfriend mistreated her. Mona dropped out of school in the ninth grade and struggled with addiction. She would earn money however she could, sometimes washing car windows with her common-law husband, and at other times earning money through darker means. She disappeared in November of 2001. A year later after the farm was raided, some skeletal remains were found and tested that came back as a match to Mona. As Picton's rampage accelerated, other aspects of his life were falling apart. In 1999, the Piggy Palace lost its nonprofit status after Picton failed to submit financial statements and was shut down. Authorities had already been suspicious of the illegal goings-on at the farm, and in February of 2002, an intensive investigation finally brought the Picton farm into the public spotlight. Acting on a search warrant related to illegal firearms, authorities uncovered evidence that pointed to something far more sinister, possibly linking Picton to the large number of missing women in the region. There were personal items that belonged to many of the missing women, and later, DNA evidence confirmed their worst fears. Robert Picton had been systematically taking women's lives and disposing of their bodies on the farm. The investigation revealed that Picton had confessed to an undercover officer while he was behind bars, boasting that he had killed 49 women and planned to make it an even 50. When asked why he did it, he would only say that he was put on earth to rid people of their evil ways. In other words, he was a sadistic psychopath. Investigators found DNA from 80 different people on the farm, indicating the number may have already passed 50. In December of 2007, he was charged with 26 counts of homicide, but he was only convicted of six counts of second-degree murder, while the other 20 were stayed. As the judge said, it would put undue hardship on the jury. That judge's statement, that's a first for me and seems completely inappropriate. Picton was sentenced to life with parole possible after 25 years, which was the harshest sentence for these charges, though he is believed to be responsible for many more deaths. 
During the investigation and trial, more truly horrific stuff would come out that was found on the farm or told to investigators by acquaintances. A good example is the 22 revolver that was found that had an adult toy strapped to the barrel with a single round fired. Picton would claim that the latex unit was a silencer, but the truth is likely much more sinister, as due to the way revolvers are designed, an actual suppressor would be ineffective. A syringe was found that was filled with a blue liquid. Robert had told a friend that opiate addicts could be easily dispatched by injecting them with cleaning products, and this could have been what he had used to do so. It seems like his depravity knew no limits, and even if he had not sold human flesh as pork, the fact that he fed his victims to his pigs tainted any meat from the farm in the most disturbing way possible. The aftermath of Picton's crimes left the community shattered and grieving. Memorials and vigils for the victims became places of mourning and reflection, highlighting the tragic loss and the systemic failures that allowed such atrocities to occur. Today, the Picton Farm stands as a haunting reminder of the evil that can lurk in the most unassuming places. The legacy of Robert Picton is a dark stain on Canadian history, a tale of unimaginable horror and a somber reflection on the vulnerability of the human condition. But the story might not be over. In 2024, Picton became eligible for day parole, though it has not been granted, and some Canadian politicians are pushing for a change to the law so that sentences can be run consecutively in cases such as Picton's. Under the current laws, he will be eligible to apply for full parole in 2027, 25 years after his 2002 arrest, which is unthinkable after what he has done. And it seems that the other inmates agree. In May of 2024, the 74-year-old was attacked at the Port Cartier facility by a 51-year-old inmate using a broken broom handle, and he had to be put on life support. At the time of writing, Picton is in a coma at a Quebec hospital and is not expected to survive.